This is our second lab session on Philippians 3, 18 to 21. In the first one, I was so moved by this word here in relationship to everything he said as he wept that we spent the whole session on his tears. Many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk. And so he's weeping as he writes this, these hard things. And so today we walk into this list of hard things, and then I'll tell you where we're going to focus. These, these folks who are, they, of, of whom he had told them, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. And then there's a break, and he starts talking about the contrast, namely us. So here are people who are utterly and totally earthly, and here are people whose citizenship is heaven. So that's coming, but we're going to spend several sessions on these characteristics. So notice, he says that they're enemies of the cross. We're going to spend a session on what that means. But before we get there, we need to find out, well, what is it about them that would move him to describe them as enemies of the cross? So we're going to skip that for the time being, come back to it maybe session after next. I'm not sure. In the future. And it's remarkable that as he, as he begins to describe them, he starts at the end, where they're going to end up. Their end is destruction. And on the way there, here are the three things that characterize them. Their, their appetites are their absolute authority, their God. They are ruled by their belly, their groin, their their desires, their appetites, their hungers, their passions. And the second thing he says is that shameful behaviors are now their glory. And we'll talk about that in a future session. And the last thing he says is they have a mindset and it's all about the earth. It's not about God. It's not about Christ. It's not about salvation. It's not about heaven. It's not about spiritual realities. It's not about anything unseen. It's all earth, 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 world, world, world. And it all ends here. So that's what I want to linger over for a few minutes now. What is this destruction? You could call this lesson maybe a little mini theology of, of hell because that's what I think he's talking about here. So how do we go about deciding what Paul means by destruction? The first thing we do is open up our concordance and find the uses that Paul makes of this word besides the context here. We'll be looking at the context in detail, but if you want to get the scope of this word for Paul and what he means often by it, you open your concordance and you look for the nearest illustrations first and then farther ones in the New Testament. And the nearest illustration, in fact, in fact, the only other illustration in the book of Philippians is right here in chapter 1, verse 28. Not frightened. The saints who walk in a way pleasing to the Lord will not be frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction. There's the word. And then here's the alternative. But of your salvation. So we learn that destruction in Paul's thinking in Philippians is the opposite of eternal salvation that comes from God. So let's broaden out a little bit now. Here's 2 Thessalonians 1, 6. God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, 
with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord. So there's a description of this destruction that's coming. It's, it's a fiery infliction of vengeance. Here's 1 Thessalonians 1.9. They themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turn, from, uh, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven. This is the same picture we just saw in 2 Thessalonians. He's coming. Whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, and here's what he's going to do when he comes, delivers us from the wrath to come. So what was called vengeance in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 is called the wrath of God in 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. And we know that Paul didn't say that in an isolated way, but says very fundamentally in Romans 5, 9, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood. In other words, it is the, the cross, the death of Jesus on the cross that these folks in Philippians are, are enemies of. And here you see one hint of why that would be. They're enemies of the cross because we are justified by his blood. Well, if we are, then much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. So remember in Philippians 1.28, salvation was the opposite of destruction. And so saved here from wrath confirms that we are thinking of the wrath of God when he says that their end is destruction. So let's broaden out a little further now and go to Jesus. Here's Matthew 7.13. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So life, understood, understood here as eternal life, surely, is the opposite of destruction. So destruction is in in the afterlife, and it is the vengeance of God and the wrath of God and the opposite of salvation and the opposite of life. And not surprisingly, it's called hell in Matthew 5, 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right eye causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. This would be the narrow way that leads to life, a life of cutting off sin from your life. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. So vengeance, wrath, destruction, hell. Now let's go one step further to Revelation and find out how terrible and how long it is. The beast, Revelation 17, 8, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. I'm choosing the same Greek word in every case. I'm finding these, these texts simply by using the concordance for the word destruction in, in Greek. And you do the same thing in English. Now, wh what is that? The bottomless pit, destruction, that's one picture of a bottomless pit. You're falling forever. I had dreams about that when I was a kid. I bet we all did. Falling and you can't stop falling till you wake up. Well, that's not a bad dream to have to connect you with reality of what hell is. Revelation 19.20 The beast was captured and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two, beast and the prophet, were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. For now you have another image, bottomless pit and uh, lake of fire and vengeance and 
destruction and wrath and hell. How long is it? How long will the enemies of God be there? Revelation 14, 9 to 11. If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur. It's the lake of fire. In the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. That is the strongest Greek way of expressing eternity, forever and forever. And they have no rest, day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. So, here we are, back where we started. Their end, these enemies of the cross, we still haven't interpreted exactly what that means, but we're starting to see some of it. Their end is destruction. And given what we've seen now of how this is the wrath of God and the vengeance of God and hell and the lake of fire and the bottomless pit and there are other images in the Bible, perhaps we get some sense of why there might have been tears flowing. Paul did not rejoice in the destruction of his adversaries. He wept over it.